welcome to the Simple Sophisticate Podcast, where intelligent living is paired with signature style. I'm your host, Shannon Abels. And whether you're listening on your commute, exercising, working in the garden, or sitting down with a hot cup of tea or a cafe au lait, thank you for tuning in. Let's get started. Welcome to the 282nd episode of The Simple Sophisticate. We're back with brand new episodes for the month of June, and I'm excited that you're tuning in, and I have a wonderful guest to bring to you today. From Paris, Oliver G. will be talking about his new, his first book that is inspired by his podcast, The Earful Tower. His book is called Paris by Ear. And it was just released this spring. And he joined me from Paris just the day after Paris came out of lockdown. And we're going to talk about all sorts of things. If you've been listening to his podcast, you know that he takes us to Paris. Um, He takes us to the big parts that are intriguing and, and, and a lot of people talk about. But more often than not, he shows us the everyday life of Paris, the things that pique his curiosity. And this book is about his podcast, but also how his career or his job as a podcaster has evolved, what brought him to Paris in the first place, and the behind the scenes that we just don't hear in each episode. We'll also talk about what it's been like in Paris during this time of confinement that we have been living through all around the world. And he just brings his enthusiasm to the conversation about his sincere love for Paris and podcasting and bringing it to his listeners and um, how he does that um, and where it comes, where that drive comes from. We will also talk about his audio experience. So he is, has a book, paperback, he has an ebook, but he also has an audio experience, which is quite unique compared to so many other audio books out there. And I think if you enjoy Oliver and you enjoy this book, it's worth picking up or purchasing the audio experience. But before we get to that conversation, I want to let you know that I will be sharing with you the Petit Plaisir this week. Oliver has joined me on this show before, episode 222. And uh, I think just simply listening to someone talk about Paris is a petit plaisir. So I do hope you enjoy our conversation. But I will bring in the petit plaisir at the end of our conversation that is entirely separate, but one I think you will enjoy. Um, A little bit more focus on love, shall we say, and our love journeys. So here is my conversation with Oliver G., the host of the podcast, The Earful Tower. Returning to the show today, the podcaster living in Paris who has taken us all over the city to discover its history, its reality, and everything fascinating and curious in between Oliver G. Oliver has just released a new book, Paris on Air, a memoir, and he joins me today from Paris. Welcome back, Oliver. Thank you so much for having me as a repeat guest. What an honor. (laughs) There's very few of those repeat guests. So this is, uh, I'm just tickled that you want to come back on and I'm, I'm so happy you're joining us from Paris out of lockdown now. Yeah, it must mean that I did something right last time or what? I think definitely it was a plus for having you on the show last time. So thank you for coming back. (laughs) Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm happy to be here. Absolutely. Now, I actually just want to dive right in. Um, I thoroughly, as we were talking before this interview began taping, I have thoroughly enjoyed the book. To listeners who enjoy his podcast, The Earful Tower, this is sincerely an extension of the show as far as his voice. You just get a lot more detail, a lot more information, and you get to know his wife, Lena, in a lovely way. I just, that's another question I'll have later in the conversation but I just enjoyed that component as well. She really is, you're really a pair and a partnership in many ways, but you're also your own people. And I think that's something that's uh, a pleasure to read. But what I want to dive into here, you came to Paris from Sweden in uh, January, 2015. We talked a little bit about that in our first conversation. So I want to jump to when Paris finally started to feel like home. And sadly, it was on an event that we did not want to have happen in November, 2015. But what was it how was it that Paris began to feel like home? Um, well, yeah, what happened was, and I'm sure your listeners will remember this, but it was uh, November, uh, Friday the 13th it was, and there was that horrific set of terror attacks that uh, took place all over the city. And this is when, so to paint the picture, I was working as a journalist covering the news, and I'd come there to cover a terror attack, the Charlie Hebdo, or Hebdo perhaps, uh, terror attack and uh, 
you know, I remember when I came here for that and it was a tough time and I didn't understand. I didn't have the context. I didn't know what it means that the city had been attacked. But uh, nine months, well, I guess it's more than nine months, 11 months later when I was uh, in Paris when that occurred and it was this sort of indiscriminate attack on Parisians who lived in these sort of, uh, I guess you'd call them hipstery, trendy neighborhoods in town, the sort of 11th arrondissement area where I was based essentially. It really, I felt, I think I wrote in the book that I flew on that day and landed on one of those days and landed at the airport and just felt like I was coming back to the Paris that I knew and I could relate a lot more to it. And I had the context that I'd built and uh, yeah, like seeing them being so resilient afterwards and sitting on the terraces and having drinks. And I did the same thing and I felt like I could relate. And even though it was still, it was pretty early, like I don't, hadn't been there a full year yet, but when those kind of huge events like that happen or those cataclysmic occurrences, then it catapults you way quicker into, you know, it's like if you have, I'll tell you what it's like, if you had a relationship that began in confinement with somebody yeah. and you were in confinement for two months, then you're not two months into a relationship. You're like two years into that relationship. Yeah. It's kind of like that's, that. That's what I think. That's a great comparison. No, you're right. Because it's bonding or it's revealing as well. Yeah. And so totally. you choose, yeah, you choose, a, you make a decision, like you said, how the city was going to go forward and you were part of that decision and movement forward and you stayed and you invested. Yeah. Sure. Great yeah. comparison. Well, speaking of you and Lena, I mean, you start the book and I love that you shared uh, who recommended this. John Baxter, actually uh, the writer, the one that many Francophiles will recognize when they hear that name, recommended you start your book with the night you in, 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 uh, proposed to Lena. And and I'm not giving anything away to readers. So don't worry, guys. It's in the first uh, first chapter. You can give it away. I don't care. It's great. I love it. Get married and it's all, you know, but that's part of the journey too through the book, which I think is well done. But that's the opportunity that I think is wonderful. We get to know Lena, and after all, um, and I'm not gonna, as I just said, uh, you share how your wedding which was a lovely event in both of your lives, was also a bit of a catastrophe um, in the most wonderful of ways, uh, uh, as many people might say. Um, can you share a glimpse of what that day was like for readers? Sure. And it's so funny. This is so fresh in my mind, not just because I've written the book about it, but literally, t literally before you called, I was just in the studio for the first time because lockdown's just finished and I was recording the audio for the audio book of this exact scene that we're talking about. So it couldn't, it couldn't be fresher, you know, like you could, you could even quiz me on the sentences. I bet I remember them. But um, the, uh, the, the wedding was, I, I wrote it in the book that it felt like just a tiny little bit cursed because everything was going so well. And this is what, this is a bit I won't give away, but something, something turned to, <laughs> to turn everything on its head in such a like outrageous way that, uh, that, that was very memorable for all the guests and me as well, but kind of, kind of ruined the day at the same time. And the way that everyone dealt with it was really wonderful. But I think, cause that's so far in the end of the book, I won't, I won't give too much away, but um, it is kind of like someone told me they thought it was a, a, a romantic book for, uh, you know, the story with Lena starting with the proposal and getting to the wedding, but also like the love for Paris and the love for, you know, language and all that stuff. So I, I'd never really set it out to write it like a romantic book, but I guess it just kind of, you know, kind of happened that way. Maybe I'm a romantic deep down. I don't know, Shannon. Well, I think you're definitely romantic in the sense that you're open to possibility. And isn't that what a romantic is? You're yes, well said. Well, and you're a traveler and you, you chose Paris and you continued to be open to learning about the language. I love that you ate raw bacon. Um, that cracked me <laughs> up. <laughs> I was like, oh, oh. oh, poor Oliver. And all the things he could eat in Paris. He, oh. oh, I will never live it down. <laughs> no, but it was lovely. And then... Well, I do want to talk about food real quick since we're talking about food. I want us because we're in the month right now that's called Gruyere Month. Um, oh, yeah. I had no idea. You taught me something. I did not know that the Parisians or French called it this. Why is it Gruyere Month? And it may not be like that right now because everything is going on, but traditionally it is. Why and what true, is it? True, true. It's, um, that's, I'm happy to give that away because that's, that's one of my favorite parts of the early in the book. But that's, um, I was hanging out with my basketball mates and one of them, I'll just retell the story. I said that, um, I was like, uh, are you guys going to play basketball next week? And just for a bit of context for your listeners, the basketball guys were kind of my gurus in teaching me about, about language and, and, you know, culture and stuff. And they said, uh, we're not going to play basketball next month. It's a day off. In fact, this whole month is a mois de gruyère, like a gruyère month. And I was like, well, what, what, what the heck does that mean? 
And they said, uh, it's like the, the Gria cheese. It's full of holes. There's so many public holidays that the month looks like it's full of holes. And that was where I said to them, oh, I don't really know my French cheeses that well. And they, like, you could have, like, from from the other side of the basketball court, you could have heard one of them slap his forehead because Gria, as, as maybe you know, Shannon, and I didn't, it's a Swiss cheese. It's not a French cheese. And it revealed to them that I didn't know anything about uh, cheese, France, eventually wine and what happened in the stories or what happened in my life is they came around to my house with arms laden with cheese all these exotic varieties of cheese and they sat down on the table and and force fed them to me until i understood it all so uh <laughs> but you're exactly right we're in the moine griere now so uh so i guess i learned something too you know <laughs> deliciously so oh what a lesson that was Gosh. well i just think that was fantastic that they were willing to you know impart upon you their wisdom and bring the cheese because that's i mean that's i mean it's not a luxury there so much as a requirement um, to daily living but it's a true luxury to someone who is learning i would imagine oh for sure and it changed it really changed the way uh like i think maybe you remember early in the book i talked about i went to buy cheese and i uh i thought i was doing uh, the guy a favor by saying uh, yeah just give me anything i don't mind i was trying to be an easy customer but yeah. it's really like a cultural dance here that you sort of uh you meant to you know you're meant to say what's good at the moment and they'll talk you through it it's like a relationship that you're having with the fromageur right and, and uh, now when i like now i do when i go buy fruit or, or cheese or anything like that uh, i'm way better at it and i like just recently i was up there and i, and I was just chatting to him i was like what what's the most popular cheese that you sell? And you know, he was talking about Comte, and then I was like, well, what is the difference between this and this age and all that? And you just get chatting about it. But at the beginning, I was terrible. I had no idea. And <laughs> and it really it takes I th- I think it takes years to get good at that stuff. Really, just that conversation piece of for that sure for sure yeah. Yeah. Go. Well, it sounds like, and you even shared this in the book that your French has come come along quite a ways as well. Um, mm. you feel very comfortable with that now. Yeah, I think. Um, like what, how I describe it is I, I'd never win any awards for my French. And yeah. if you were to put me on live TV right now, yeah. like if this was a French podcast, I probably wouldn't even want to do it because I'm so far from my personality in, yeah. uh, in English or in Australian English. But if you were to send a plumber around here or if you had to send me into the tax office to fix something, um, I could do all that stuff or you know, call a banker or that kind of stuff. I can do it. And that's the highest level that you need, I think, okay. uh, in terms of a necessity. But it's not, I'm not going to quote poetry if that's what you're about to ask me next. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate you sharing, sharing that you feel comfortable going into a bank now and having basically a negotiation because there, there are a few scenes in your book where you share, uh, nope, I have no clue how to get out of this one. Not that it was a bad situation, but your friends basically came in and said, oh, we got this. And they go in, have a conversation. And it worked out. So you yeah, were going in. I think to be fair, it was a bad situation because I had negative two thousand euros in the bank or something. <laughs> but we, we're all different, Shannon. I'm not sure. But <laughs> in those days, uh, I got a friend, Clovis. His name is to uh, to come in and help me, and that was wonderful. I was so new to France, and he came in and made this big scene of uh, sort of arguing for my right to to you know to not have my money stolen from me. And now, I mean, I, I could do it now and I'm sure I could have the same result, but never with the same charm and grace as that guy had. I mean, he's a TV host, so he was wonderful. But right. but my French is good enough now to, my French is good enough for anything. I'm quite confident to say that. Okay. Well, I would think a, a smile would help too. And that was one thing, actually, I enjoyed this section of the book. You talk about that, even to um, those of us who may be told it's okay what do you say go in smile say bonjour and ça va actually ask the question whereas we're not really as you said it's going to give you away number one but you say just embrace it do it yep. what, what uh i mean because i would imagine that's opened many many doors for you uh, yep. what else do you think has opened the doors for you in your podcasting career as this is beginning to unfold um i think i i was trying to think what separated me from other uh people doing similar kind of podcasts and that kind of stuff to me because there's kind of a few of them now and i think i'm a bit like i think i'm just a bit crazy like just a bit daring to look like an idiot um to i don't know what what the word is that i'm searching for but it's not coming across very positively but uh like i'm not a, i'm not afraid to look stupid you know like uh for example there's uh the there's this, this time that i interviewed um you know caroline de maigret the supermodel oh, yes yes uh, 
Yeah. So I just saw her walking on the street and I just went up to her and I was like, I was like, hey, I was like, you're Caroline De, I was like, you're Caroline de Maigret, aren't you? And she, you know, we got chatting a little bit and she was a bit sort of taken aback that I just stopped her on the street. But then I said something like, um, hey, listen, do you ever do uh, interviews in English with Australian podcasters? Just something stupid. And she kind of laughed and she was like, look, look, I'll be honest with you. I'm extremely busy. A lot of people want to interview. You know, she was very, uh, very friendly about it, but she just sort of laid it out. And then she goes, but if you want to do the podcast right now in a cafe right there, she like pointed to a cafe. She's like, I'm game. If you can record it on your phone, let's do it. And I was like, yeah, let's do it. And uh, as we were walking to the cafe, I, I had to like, I got my phone out and double check the name of her recent book. Like, I really was as underprepared as you could be, but it was great. And it was wonderful. And the sound was bad because, you know, like where there, there's an espresso machine in the background, but it was extremely raw and real. I say, I and, uh, that, yeah. I think a lot of a lot of podcasters would say no, no. I'd rather, um, you know, sensible people would say I'd rather get you in the studio and we do this properly in six months. But I was just like, no, nah, let's do it. And uh, you know, so I'm very keen to just capture the raw whatever's happening. And I think that kind of reflects, maybe even in the book, but th- that's kind of who I am. And I think it's been a, an advantage, even though it, it so. it's unfair. But I think it, it just worked out like that. Well, I think that is what. At least that's what I enjoy about it. For example, that conversation, I enjoyed it because I felt like I could be in Paris for a moment. I mean, we've yeah. here Paris. I think that's what people miss when they're not there or in France. It, there's the sound, there's the energy. And granted, we're not physically there for the direct energy, but that's what you bring us as well. I mean... <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that changed. That interview was really um, instrumental in changing the way I did things because when I put it out, I was really nervous that people would say, Oh, the waiter in the background was so noisy. And when he dropped the plates, he dropped something, I remember. And, uh, oh, that espresso machine. And the, when the waiter interrupted you to do this or whatever, I thought people would go crazy. Like, oh, I ruined the interview. For, but it was the opposite. And then uh, when I realized that, I, even though I got a studio in Paris that I used to use for every single episode, then I was like, hang on, I'm going to record anywhere. And if there's the siren, uh, you know, that iconic police siren from Paris or the sound of the the water in the Seine River or, or, you know, a man bringing a hot chocolate to the table, then all the better. And I ended up getting emails. I love that I could hear the church bells in this one. So uh, it changed. It was a game changer, that one. And it just, um, you know, now I record most of them on the go. And it makes it a lot easier because now I can travel to people or meet them in a park or whatever. And it's, it's, I think it's a lot more natural. And I like it like that. Well, and it shows your sincere and, and curiosity in the culture which is, that, that's been there since the beginning. So thank you for doing that for us. I appreciate Hey, that. I'm happy to share it. <laughs> well, speaking of that, I mean, you did go, you have gone out in the country of outside of Paris. And um, I think you said your first uh, uh, exploration or trip out was to, to Brittany um, and hopping on a train without a ticket. I loved it during the, yeah. one of the many strikes that they've have gone on on the trains. But I, I'm curious, and obviously you went on your um, your tour at, for your honeymoon around Paris, France with all sorts of adventures uh, that you'll share in the book. But what was one of the most unexpected explorations you have made while touring around France or in Paris? And I know there's probably so many to choose from. Yeah, I mean, I mean, just for context for the for the listeners, yeah, this was like a two month journey where we traveled at thirty miles an hour on a on a little scooter. So we saw so much, we saw so so much of France. We couldn't, we legally couldn't take the the highways oh. because we were too slow. So we we stopped in every village. Like we we weren't like we're going to go around this village to save five seconds. We just went right down the high street or the main street or whatever. So uh, we saw we saw a heck of a lot, but um, in terms of unexpected surprises, the main one would be all the doctors that I had to go to when I got <laughs> the, the the Lyme disease, which was horrible, but Gosh. super interesting. Yeah. Uh, but but um, <laughs> but I tried to make positive out of that. I think I think uh, I got away with it. But the the unexpected surprise for me were places like Annecy, or the French say Annecy, Annecy. which were was absolutely beautiful alpine little town. I thought it was the most beautiful town okay. uh, in the whole country. I'm sure of it. If it's not that, it's Saint Remy de Provence, which uh, I visited on a later trip oh, yeah. but just, just stunningly beautiful places that we saw um so like those kind of things or um like the, the the wild beauty of going through the mountain ranges and seeing these huge eagles or hawks or whatever they were flying above us 
like uh, in the Jura Mountains. We just, you know, like when you look at a tour book, yeah. like they probably would say places like Annecy or, or Bordeaux or Saint Remy or whatever. Yeah. But the, the, those little places that we found that probably I didn't even mention them in the book, but just going through them or, you know, seeing like an elderly woman waving from the, the window of her house as we went through a, a village in the middle of nowhere. It was just, it really gave me a love for, for France that I don't think I had until I really explored it. And I've been telling people, people ask me about this a lot since the book came out, that um, if you do come to Paris, you absolutely have to find some time to get out and see yes. something. In the country, uh, yeah. Yeah, and not just the main ones either, like Nice and, you know, the, uh, I don't know, Mont Saint-Michel or whatever. Like just, just if you do go somewhere else, drive there and stop somewhere different and weird because you really get an idea of the French people. Mm -hmm. And then when you're in back in the States or wherever you are and you meet another French person, your, your mind won't go straight to Paris, which they're so sick of hearing. You know, if you can say to them, oh, I went to saint remy de provence they'll be like, oh, my God, so thank you for not mentioning Paris straight away. That is so true. I, that's what I've been trying to tell people as well. And, I, I, you know, I'm trying to figure, I've been trying to figure out why don't people do that more often. But I think the language barrier is intimidating, you know, to go mm. rent that car, to go get on that train that's not going to leave you sure. just in Paris. But, I, but from my sure. experience those people in those small towns at the train station or at the car rental place are actually really, really helpful. And they are yeah. to make sure that you figure it out. That was, that was my sure. experience anyway. I 100%, I, I yeah. recommend what you just said. I could not agree with you more on that. So everybody get out of Paris. <laughs> yeah, do it. And I think, I think the other thing is like, obviously all the songs and the Audrey Hepburn movie, she's always going to Paris. So we feel like we know it. And, uh, you know, these small towns like Annecy don't have that benefit of Audrey Hepburn and Cary Grant smooching on the, on the lakeside, right? Yeah. But, um, but you just got to take that leap of faith and believe it because there are some really just uh, almost aggressively beautiful places yeah. to discover. And that, you know, one way to, for people to, 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 to get a taste of that, I always say, is watch the Tour de France. Just oh, yeah. if you're not a cyclist, for Americans, even if you're not a cyclist, watch it for the beauty because that's where you get an idea of all the unique little small towns along the way and the environment of the, the geography is just... Oh, mm. That'll mm. give you an idea of what we're talking about. And then trust us, do it, go see it because it will not disappoint. It won't. Trust us, <laughs> trust us everyone. <laughs> well, I do want to talk a little bit about how when you made the decision to step away from journalism and 100% and really dive into podcasting, I mean, you really did make a clean break for the most part. And I, I admire your tenacity to do that. And I, I can't imagine the decision making that went into that. But at the same time, it didn't sound like you doubted it. You just went. And I, yeah. that speaks to something that that's what I'd like to ask you a question about is what was it inside of you that said, yep, I'm doing this. I'm doing this. I think, um, I think it was just like pure confidence that it was good. Like I just believed it. I really believed it, um, which I don't know if it's in, I don't know if in America you can say that kind of thing, but in like uh, some countries, like in Sweden, if my wife is Swedish, if you say that kind of thing, it sounds very, you know, cocky and self-assured, uh, which they don't like there. But in Australia, I think you can get away with it. I think in America you can get away with it. Yeah. But um, but I really did. Like I had I put a I put a heck of a lot of time into it and uh and I you know I just really believed in it. And I uh, I I'd started getting emails from people who liked it beyond just enjoying it. You know what I mean? Like people who who I just get really kind emails from people. And my logic was always if one person's gonna write an email like that then it's it's just common sense to me that 10 people will feel like that. Yeah. Or if 100 people will tell me they shared it with their friends, then it makes sense that 1,000 people will. Yeah. And even though I was right at the beginning and I was – and it's kind of a theme of the book. I was so broke and I was so uh, – you know, I was, I was at the bottom of the pile. I just really believed it. And it makes it easier for it to go forward when you know – when you're confident in what you do, yeah. you know, I see a lot of people starting up. I mean, I get a lot of emails from, I got one today from someone starting up a podcast <laughs> and they wanted to have me on the show and, and it's, it's great and it's very um, flattering and everything, but it was very half hearted and they hadn't done anything. They hadn't done an episode. They weren't really even committed to it. They'd send me the email without Oliver at the start. You know, they're like, we see you're an expat blogger or whatever. I was like, forget it. You know? You know, it's so different, you know, to the one that you sent me the way, you know, you've read the book and everything. You're, you're invested in it. You want your podcast to be great. Same as I do. 
I just totally believed in it. And then I got to a position where uh, I, I mentioned in the book that two people recognized me by my voice or by seeing me at, uh, within five minutes. And I was like, the, if I could extrapolate what's happening, then it makes sense that it will be a success. It's just a matter of hard work and time. So yeah. I, it's crazy, but I just quit the job. And, and to be fair, I did want to change anyway. And I just put 100% of myself into the podcast. And at the start, I wrote in the book too, but like to be just, I mean, people might be listening thinking I, I uh, you know, I had a huge backup of money or whatever. What I did is I did a bit of freelance work on the side. And I remember thinking, oh, you can, you can do all right out of freelance if you work really hard. But then I thought, hang on, I'm just still a journalist. This is crazy. So I, I totally cut it off and it made me very hungry to uh to monetize the podcast and make it a success and that was about two years ago now and and look at me now i'm talking to you shannon so it must have it must have worked <laughs> well no i i have to say i well i think and i i did enjoy that scene in the book that you describe you were at your one of your favorite cafes your Pel- the peloton correct. Is that correct? Yep. and she just totally recognized your voice and she also knew you might be there because you've talked about this place yeah, so she would yeah. go into your haunts not all of them but a lot of them and um i think that's that's the key that we see a sincerity and we've said that already in the conversation but there's a sincerity and there's a oh gosh and it comes through it comes through and yeah. i just, and, and i think like that story that you just said the woman um like she and others had been saying like, oh, I love the show. I've, uh, you know, they'd say, I love the show. I booked the, a tour with that tour guide you had on. Like, or they'd say, like, I booked every single day I booked a tour with that tour guide. Or, uh, you know, I went to every restaurant and cafe you recommended. And I was just sitting there going, this doesn't make sense. Like, I, there's, there's a missed opportunity here. And then I, you know, it took a lot. You wouldn't believe how much I think about things, Shannon, but I'm always uh, trying to twist it in a way to make it work, especially in those days. And then it just, I don't know. Things just started falling into place. Well, you started to follow your path because you realized, oh, if I can give a tour and then if I could do the, you know, you started to put them th- some things together and they didn't all work out perfectly as you first did them, but they eventually did. Um, you know, the Facebook, the Peloton, not Peloton, uh, the Patreon. Yep. You, I mean, you started to kind of just follow the signs. Yep. That's what I yeah. started to read. And that's, yeah. you didn't think too much. You thought creatively. You thought outside of the box. Mm. True, true. I mean, I just, my goal has always been, and maybe it's the same with every podcast, or maybe it's the same with you, but my goal is just, just keep growing it and it will be easier to, to figure out any next step, I guess. Well, and, and I think when, we, back to that woman who, who hired the same tour guide or whatnot that you did, there's a trust that I'm realizing, and I know that's what's happening with you, it seems like, that they trust you. They trust your mm-hmm. opinion and it's because you are being real there yeah. across. And so I think that's the key thing about whatever you choose to do and whatever you are doing, they are trusting where you're going with it because they trust that you sincerely invested in this. No, I wouldn't. One thing I'd like to talk about is uh, you interview a lot of different people and your journalism background really gave you a lot of different connections in the city. And I appreciate the fact that you're interviewing people that are going about their lives in Paris. It's not just the big names in Paris. You're interviewing mayors. I really enjoy the conversation with your mayors in the past. And I have yet to tune into the one you just posted because you, what lockdown just ended in Paris. So listeners, we are taping this on May 12th. Lockdown just ended on the 11th. So yesterday, and you've already interviewed the mayor of the fourth, fourth arrondissement in the Marais. Can you give us just a glimpse of what he revealed to you about how things are going to go, what the vibe is? Yeah. He's um he's an interesting guy, and I'm um, I'm pretty fortunate that a mayor speaks such good English, you know. Uh, and I've had him on the show a couple of times, and he said, um, he he said that Paris is gonna it's gonna be a long time before it gets back to normal, but that they've sort of been anticipating the changes that we're gonna see, and so the big sort of fundamental change that that came out of that conversation with him that I've already seen happening is things like um, they're gonna work harder to pedestrianize the marais get rid of cars and add bike lanes so if you go down to rue de rivoli the big sort of access street that goes through the third fourth or maybe the first as well aaron they've 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 already in the past year taken out a whole lane just for bikes now and uh, the middle lane they're turning into like at the moment it looks like a bike car lane but i think it's going to be bikes so things like that they're they're anticipating where things are going and they're changing it and it's always interesting talking to to him, if not if not just because he's a mayor, but because he spends his whole time hanging out with the mayor, mayor uh, Anadago, 
And I'm like, I've got like a kind of like a, you know, like a child, you know, like the same way I liked Michael Jordan when I was 10 is how I, how I'm fascinated by Anne Hidalgo now. Like I always just want to know what she's like. I find her really interesting. Now, let's not even get started on Macron who I'd be, who I'd love to talk to. But, uh, <laughs> I'm her at the, at, almost got you pretty close to him on that inauguration or the speech oh, day. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's true. That's true. But it looks like, I mean, things are changing in Paris, things like pedestrianization. So all, all the listeners of yours who, who like to marry and go down there, it'll probably look different by the time that uh, you get down there again, I think. Well, and that's the next question I was going to ask you. I, I heard that um, borders, so, you know, to the rest of Europe are shut for sure until July 24th. Is that what I'm hearing? Uh, yeah, I heard that too, but I'm I'm uh, I'm purposely not putting much stock in anything and not planning anything because it keep things keep changing and the rules keep changing and like I'm right now like literally today May 12th I'm meant to be in LA or San Diego or something on uh, on a big book tour for the book but uh, you know that got cancelled so I'm not meant to be anywhere really like, I mean I, you know I'm in limbo so there's no point in me planning anything or uh, looking forward to. You know, we, we were talking to go over to Sweden, uh, Lena Swedish, but I think there's just no point in putting a date on it because even if she can get over there as a Swede, she might not be able to come back here for a while or there might be quarantine. So the whole thing's such a mess that I'm just uh, trying to make the most of being in Paris and, okay. and uh, enjoying life here, you know. Well, and you can really bring all that Paris to us and so many people that have had plans, as you know, couldn't be there. And um, I think just seeing Paris in this new light with very mm. few it will be interesting um, yeah yeah i think it's a um it's the perfect time for armchair travel it's the perfect time to listen to podcasts wouldn't you say yes i do and you, you're taping your audiobook of this so you have this book paris on air a memoir available um, obviously in paperback but also ebook mm-hmm. but now you are taping and making available the audio version um what can what can you kind of talk us through that so listeners can maybe tune in and listen to the book if they want chapter by chapter yeah, i'm so glad that you said that because it's really nice to get a chance to talk about this <laughs> uh, but so when i always wanted to do the audio book and a lot of people email me like i'm only going to get it if you narrate it and i was like of course i'm going to narrate it it'd be crazy if i got anyone else to do it but um i've always thought that audio books can be a little lame you know especially ones where people read out another person's story or whatever and I, I never really get into them so I want to make this one more like an audio experience and what I mean by that is like all the characters so that even the people we've talked about in the past half an hour like uh, Clovis at the bank or Fabian who took us to Brittany or all those kind of people um, even Caroline de Maigre I just put that in there today um, I got their voices or I asked them to record their lines and I, yeah so, so uh, it was like most of them I recorded before the lockdown. I went into the studio with, uh, with Fabian, for example, and we talked through the trip to, Br- to Brittany. Like he read it all and he was, he was laughing when I was reading the funny bits. And then at the end of it, I go, um, you know, so Fabian, is that how you remembered it? And then we talked a little bit about it. Uh-huh. So um, it's really cool. I got to send you a link as a thank you for being on my show, you know, but uh, sorry, as a thank you for having me on your show is what I meant to say <laughs> Um, love it. I didn't realize that that little detail, that's going to make it really special. Oh, that would make it. Love that. But I've been doing that with music and with sound effects. So, you know, do you remember that scene where there's uh, where I was riding the scooter through the storm in the Mediterranean? Okay. Right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes. So on that bit. Yeah. Yeah. So that bit, I had the sound of a scooter like, and then it was like, then the thunder came. It was like, crash and then i put this really cool music building up and i was like and then we raced along the mediterranean the water was to our right the thunder was above us the mountains on the left you know like that kind of thing and then uh i, I went all in and every 10 minutes takes me like three hours to make oh, yeah. so so i'm so glad to be almost finished with it but um it's going to be a cool memory not just the fact that it's a memoir for me and i it's my own life yeah. secondly that i've got all my friends and stuff yeah. to be in it but thirdly, it's going to be a memento for me with this lockdown because I've been recording it every day from the same bed I'm sitting on right now. <laughs> um, you know, and like little bits, like for example, there's a, there was like a, a banker, like the woman who was the banker or something. I don't know who that woman is, so I'd get people to fill in. So I literally, I was out on my balcony in Montmartre and I saw my next door neighbor, a French woman. I was like, do you mind reading some lines for me? And then she, she you know, things like that. So it really is... Um, 
it, it's it's so far from an audio book. It's like that's why I called it an audio experience. But I think you'll love it. I'm going to send it to you. Good way to describe it: audio experience. Okay, I get it now. Now that makes some, that's actually a better label. I mean, that would yes, that distinguishes it from regular audio books. You definitely yeah. up the game. I like it though. I like it. That takes a lot of technical work too. I don't know how. Oh you my do. god! Never again! Never again! <laughs> Well, I was going to ask you really quickly. Um, it sounds like you and Lena came out of, uh, of a lockdown. Well, uh, what was, how did it go for you? I mean, that was almost two months, what 59 days, I think is what I saw. Right. How, so what was a high? What was the low? The, um, it was different for both of us because I got permission from police to go around delivering my book on my scooter. Oh, they did? said it was fine to do that, uh, which meant that I got to see a bit of the town and you know, maybe I, I put the book in people's baskets that they lowered down from the second, third, fourth floor. It was pretty cool, actually. It was very French. So I got out and I saw a bit of the city, but Lena hadn't left the one kilometer radius of Montmartre. So she said, we're scooting to the other side of town, parking the bike and going for a walk. And that's exactly what we did. We went to the left bank, strolled along Boulevard Saint-Michel, which was really beautiful, as always, and then went to the Peloton, the coffee shop that you mentioned, and had... Uh, had a delicious coffee and we stopped at the Louvre on the way back. And I, maybe you saw on Instagram or Facebook. Yeah, I took a picture in front of the pyramid with there's just no one there it at was. all. And we just took a picture of us. You know, there's a lot of energy and smiling because we're just so happy to be out. And it's so cool to see Paris without the tourists as well. And uh, and yeah, and then we and then we came home again because we felt almost guilty to be outside after being so conditioned to living in 300 square feet. Exactly. Condition. That's so true. Well, I am so happy that Paris and the whole country is out, uh, at least if nothing else, for a little more freedom. As you, as we know, it's not entirely off, but so much better than it was. So I'm happy to hear that. Yeah, me, I believe me. Me too. <laughs> All right, listeners. Oliver G's new book, Paris on Air, a memoir, is out now in paperback, audio, and ebook. And be sure to check out his virtual book tour schedule. It's going to be all over the place. Like by the time that this episode comes out, there'll still be episodes. I mean, still be, you know, virtual things happening. So, And don't forget, if you haven't already, but I have a feeling many of you already have, tune in, subscribe to his podcast, The Earful Tower. Catch up on all the episodes, whether wherever you enjoy listening to your podcasts so you can escape to Paris. Thank you for joining me, Oliver. Thank you so much, Shannon. I want to thank Oliver again for joining me on The Simple Sophisticate. His book is sincerely a wonderful read. If you enjoy his podcast, you will enjoy this book. This is Oliver G. talking to you, but now in written form. And it's a lot of fun to read. So Paris by Ear is available now, audio, paperback, and as an audio experience. Be sure to visit theearfultower.com to find all of his podcast episodes, the virtual book tour, and his most recent episode, which took him to Shakespeare and Company, an interview he has been wanting to have, and he got it. And it is worth a listen. His book is there, available for sale as well. Shakespeare and Company, the famed English bookstore in Paris. Congratulations, Oliver. All right, this week's Petit Plaisir is... A new series that just came out, and I just watched the first three episodes this weekend. And it is called Love Life, and it is starring Anna Kendrick, the Academy Award nominee Anna Kendrick, who is uber talented. And she is starring in one of the first original series that has been put on HBO Max. HBO Max is HBO's new streaming service that just began this last Wednesday, so May 27th, which was supposed to kick off with a Friends reunion, but that will happen just in delayed form later on in this year is what I've been hearing. But Love Life, let's talk about that real quick. So this is an episodic series, which is a reflection over the last eight years of Darby's life. And Darby is played by Anna Kendrick, set in New York City. The show covers her journey from her first love to her final love. And it's a unique way of telling the story. And I think it's definitely going to keep viewers hooked because you're curious as to who she's going to end up with, knowing she will end up with someone that's already foreshadowed in the first episode. Each episode is about one relationship. It's usually about a year apart. So every episode is covering a year. Not a minute is wasted in each of the three, first three episodes that I've seen. And it's not only about her love life. It's about her friendships. It's about her social circle. It is also about her career and her journey through learning and growing as an individual. Now, as I immediately see it, being someone who grew up with Sex and the City, I think, ah, oh, she's like Carrie, but she's not. 
She is, she does have some similarities, but she doesn't. There is definitely a, a 21st century, a more contemporary, current awareness about this character that we see in Anna Kendrick's Darby. We also have this focus on the growth of the individual. And since we know generally where this story will end, so to speak, it is an interesting exploration of the self. But there are different writers for each episode. But listening to Anna Kendrick's interview this last Sunday on NPR was insightful and helpful. And this is her first episodic um, role. She's normally in films, as we know. And uh, this is an interesting role for her, she said, because she actually felt that there were more similarities between her and her character than she was initially comfortable with. And I have to say, as someone who is watching this, and she is clearly playing a character who's about 10 years younger than I am, um, as far as when the 2020 will roll around for her on this, I think just that exploration as you're watching this of your own love journey, each of us has our own love journey. Each of us will have learned lessons differently um, along the way and at different ages and periods along our along the way as well. But that's what I'm enjoying about this. So you start following her when she's in her mid-20s. And this will end when she's in her mid-30s approximately. So it could give or take a handful of years there. Um, but everyone's journey doesn't happen at a certain time. You, and that's part of, you know, I think we need to be careful when we watch this series as well, that we don't say, oh, this should happen then. This is what should happen here. This is a com- comedy. First of all, this is a comedy series. Um, so there's some lighthearted writing in here along with this journey, but it's also an opportunity to reflect on our own journey and to remind ourselves that there's something to learn along the way with every relationship, whether it's a friendship or a romantic relationship or a fling or whatever, or observation of someone else going through something that, and that someone might be someone we love, a friend, um, a parent, um, a colleague or a coworker. And so I'm very curious to see how the remaining episodes will play out. I'm definitely curious and I'm definitely intrigued. Like I said, I watched the first three episodes, but let me give you the trailer and you can take a listen um, to it. And I'll put the trailer as well on the show notes so you can watch it as well as listen to it. And I'll be right back on the other side of the trailer of Love Life on HBO Max. I'm I'm Augie, by the way. Darby. Furby? Darby. Darby. Yeah, I know. I've gotten Furby before. It's... Have you found the one? No, I uh, found some losers on Match.com. I just feel like I'm failing all the time, you know? Like, is it always this hard? Why do you need a boyfriend right now? This isn't Jane Austen times. I'm sorry. I'm just having a small life panic. I just want to be the kind of woman who knows what she wants and she's not afraid to go after it. You should be loved for the little derp to derp that you are. Oh my God. I ran into Augie for the first time in two years. So he's back in New York, apparently, which I would have known if I hadn't unfollowed him. And then I wouldn't have been blindsided wearing Crocs. Ew. up in a moment we slept together one time i don't owe you anything i decide who i sleep with and who i love i'm proud of you you've grown into this brave resilient independent woman it feels really right which is terrifying but worth it in the end He was not ready to be in a relationship. Also, I got really drunk at his dad's wake. No, that is okay. I mean, I puked at Jim's cousin's bat mitzvah. This all happened in front of his ex-wife. Oh, okay. You win. <laughs> now, let me just start off by saying, if, you're, if you just heard that last scene and a few of the lines in the trailer, this is too young for me. Oh my gosh, I'm over that. That's the whole point. Who we are today, wherever that might be, in our, in our life journey, our love journey, is not who we were 5, 10, 15, 20, 30, 40 years ago if we've chosen to learn the lessons along the way. We were young. We were ignorant. We did some stupid things when we were in our 20s. And that's what you're going to see her learn along the way. 
who you see in the first couple episodes is not going to be the same person making the same mistakes in the last few episodes. And I think that was the important selling point for me because I don't want to watch an epi- a show about 20-year-olds. That's not what I'm tuning in for. What I'm tuning in for are the mistakes and how she learns from. And so, like I said, as you watch her go through this and you see her particularly being directed to behave a certain way in a particular relationship moment to bring that lesson to the forefront for the viewer, if you're watching it closely. So what I mean by that, that last scene that they're talking about, we know that that is someone who is behaving in an immature, insecure fashion at this particular wake. And you see her struggling with some different issues and you're like, ah, that's why she's doing it. She's insecure. She's not secure in this relationship. Um, And she realizes it too. This is not, like I said, they don't go to extremes on either end, which I appreciate. Okay. A few more things. I think part of what I appreciate also is that the people that she dates aren't made out to be bad people. They, they don't have these extreme eccentricities and they're not out made out to be the bad, in this case, guy as she's dating men. They're just not meeting at the time where they will be able to have the best relationship. And for one reason or another, they realize it or one of them realizes it and the other one, yeah, I haven't learned that lesson or I'm not in a place where I would be the best partner or I haven't anyway. So I think that's a significant difference from Sex in the City. It doesn't get to be too crass. Um, it doesn't, though, go to the syrupy sweet. Um, it's still focusing on love lives um, predominantly because it is called Love Life. Um, but anyway, I think if you're looking for a series to follow, a new episode airs every Thursday night on HBO Max. Um, this might be a fun one for you to enjoy. And I think the other part about this, again, this is me just with regards to my reflections on it, is that sometimes we don't realize what we didn't know until we reflect. And it's nice to be able to take that time to reflect. And if it's through a film or a book or whatever means it is, it's helpful to say, you know what, that's why I wasn't able to be fully present in that relationship. Or that's why I wasn't ready for that relationship. I couldn't see it then because I didn't have the tools or I didn't have the experience or I didn't have the perspective. But I do now. And I think seeing those mistakes that she makes or they make, um, is helpful. Um, whether it's for closure that you're looking for or for aha moments that you're looking for, or just pure enjoyment to realize that we're all on our own unique journey. And as long as we keep trying to strive forward and learn from our mistakes and our successes, it'll be a beautiful one. So again, the show is Love Life starring Anna Kendrick on HBO Max. You, you can subscribe to HBO Max anywhere and watch it anywhere. Um, the first seven days are free. Otherwise, you pay $14.99 a month. Um, so I'm giving it a go. We'll see how I like it. I may keep it. I may not. But right now, I'm, I'm going to be watching Love Life. I hope you've enjoyed this week's Petit Plaisir, where each week ideas are shared to make the everyday all the more enjoyable. Tune in at the end of each episode where I'll recommend a book, a film, a show, a recipe, anything that is a simple pleasure to satiate your sophisticated taste. Before we wrap up today, I want to say a thank you to two listeners who took the time the last month and a half to write a positive review for what they found when they tuned in to The Simple Sophisticate. This one comes from Mary Michelle 68 and she wrote, I stumbled upon The Simply Luxurious Life a few months ago and was instantly hooked. Shannon shares great insights that I never knew I needed, but always make my day a little better. She's a shining example of how with just a little intention, you can elevate your every day to something extraordinary with without breaking the bank. Bonus points for including all her tips in the show notes so we can follow up on all her suggestions. Thank you very much, Mary Michelle. I appreciate the specific reasons you enjoy tuning in and what you appreciate about the show. As always, the show notes are always available at the episodes number podcast and the episodes number. So for today, visit the simplyluxuriouslife.com slash podcast 282. And the second review I'd like to share, this one comes from a listener in Poland, and it's titled, How to Find Your Way in a World of All Kinds of Excess. And this is from MWKPL, and they wrote, Seemingly Being from Another World. This listener is an MD and a young mother living in a Central European country and not a dog owner. I find this podcast relatable and useful. I do appreciate a broad choice of subjects with practical approach and the fact that every episode seems to be well thought through. It also brings a sense of calm and makes me want to visit Oregon. 
Keep up the good work. Well, we'd love to have you come to Oregon and I so appreciate your review. Thank you for sharing how this is a podcast. This is a, this is a blog. This is an online destination for anyone who's trying to figure out how to live their best life. And all of us are going to do that in a unique way way. There are tools along the way that will help each one of us. And once we learn those, we really can navigate far more successfully no matter what life brings our way. If you too are enjoying The Simple Sophisticate, your reviews and positive rankings do a tremendous amount for introducing new potential listeners to this program so they'll know what they'll discover when they tune in. Thank you to everyone who already has left a review or a ranking. Your time is greatly appreciated as we're at more than 700 reviews and rankings worldwide with a very strong five-star rating. So thank you very much. It could not have happened without you, the listeners of this podcast. So thank you to everyone for tuning in today. I'm happy to be back. I'm excited to be back. We'll have a brand new episode next Monday and I'll be back then. Stay well and have a wonderful week. Bonjour.